the East Coast CP base now. Here are the red dot is where the airport is. That's where the CRTC is. And one of the things I like about Gulfport, we're going to a place like Savannah in, in particular. Alpena and Volk are cool. But Savannah and Gulfport, Belux, they both have a lot of history. A lot of civil war, uh, war between the states history. A lot of neat old buildings. Of course, part of the issue with the Gulf Coast is what neat old buildings survived uh, Katrina. <laughs> I was talking to someone earlier tonight. The buildings that had the least damage for Katrina were the oldest ones. Back when they knew how to build. Well, I take that yeah. back. That's not fair. Back when the standards for construction were different. And as you'll see, both were the house itself survived fairly well. Pensacola. This is the bay that leaves in through Pascagoula. Of course, you get over here, Bay St. Louis, uh, St. Louis, uh, Pass Christian. Mobile is over about here, Mobile Bay. Pensacola is over about here. This is a very important part of the real estate of the area. Part of the reason was with all these bays and inlets, if you spent any time down on the Gulf Coast, what are they good for? Blockade running. What's one of the first things the North did after the war started? They put blockading squadrons into the Gulf, down the Atlantic coast, all along the coast, all the way from the tip of Florida, actually, you know, all the way from the Chesapeake Bay to Brownsville, all the way around. They had to rebuild the U.S. Navy, get ships out to stop the blockade runners. And the most effective way they had, short of intercepting the blockade runners, was to take property, close off these bays and inlets, cut off the Confederate light line, lifeline. So believe it or not, there actually was a Battle of Biloxi as part of this effort by the North. Now, the unit that was charged with defending the Gulf Coast around Biloxi and Gulfport was the 3rd Mississippi. And this is, you know, classic militia, because these guys all came from the local area. Company H, I know for a fact, came from Past Christian. Here's what happened. Um, on 3 April 1862, the Federals landed 500 men in Biloxi with the intent of taking the coast in that area, shutting down the blockade runners, uh, getting control of the anchorages, which would have been useful for them, uh, Ship Island, which is off the coast. I'm not going to try backing up turned to be about to be a pretty good anchorage, and there was actually a Confederate fort out there, which they took quickly. The uh, Confederate States Navy responded by sending in three gunboats, the CSS Carondelet, the Pamlico, and the Oregon. But the Navy outnumbered them, and eventually the Confederate ships, after a few shots, had to pull away. Okay, now while this is going on, the 3rd Mississippi rushed in to Biloxi and engaged the, the Union so soldiers, and actually gave a good account of themselves. Uh, the situation was in doubt for the North. They'd only put 500 men ashore. And this is still early in the war, so a you know, Confederate regiment still has a fair number of people assigned to it. However, while this is all going on, um, Confederate, the Union Navy pulled a quick one, and further down the coast at Pass Christian, which is the next inlet, dropped 1,200 troops and had the two forces, the Biloxi Union troops and the Pass Christian troops, start moving towards each other. Guess who was caught in the middle? Third Mississippi. They gave a good fight. They did what they could. But after a certain point, the commander of the third urged that all the residents of Gulfport, Biloxi, past Christian evacuate, which they did. And that ended the Battle of Biloxi. It lasted less than a day. And like, unfortunately, like happened a lot of times on the coast when the uh, North did an amphibious operation, combined Army and Navy, they held onto this property through the end of the war. So that was pretty much the extent of Biloxi and Gulfport's participation in the war between the states. We get to the end of the war, three years later. Where's the president? Who knows where the president is? Give a little bit back on his background. He was a native of Christian County, Kentucky, which is the Hopkinsville area. Fort Campbell is there now for UX Navy types, or Army types. He graduated from West Point in uh, 1828 at the age of 20, and he was described by a classmate thusly. This is Cadet Jefferson Davis, who was, um, by that time in his life, when he went to West Point, was living, had been living in Mississippi for several years. He was distinguished in the Corps for his manly bearing and high-toned and lofty character. All right, let's fast forward. I'll take a break here. Let's fast forward to when he was president. What was one of the issues with Davis as a president? High-toned, lofty character, tended to look down on people. Did not get along well with his generals, with the possible exception of one of his worst generals, Braxton Bragg. That seemed to be one of the few they ever actually... And, for, and Robert E. Lee, of course. He deferred to General Lee. Anyway, his figure was very soldier-like, rather robust. His step springy, and he resent, when he walked, it resembled the tread of an Indian brave on the warpath. He went into the Army in 1828, did seven years, was involved in the Black Hawk War, 
uh, who was the famous Indian chief that was captured in the Black Hawk, right? Davis was part of his escort to get him down to Jefferson Barracks for prison. Uh, he resigned in 1835 and moved to his brother's plantation at Briarfield, which is Warren County, just south of Vicksburg, Mississippi. Became a plantation, uh, worked the plantation. His brother died. Eventually, Briarfield passed to Jefferson Davis. Got into politics, married the general's daughter, uh, his first wife, who tragically died within a couple of months of the wedding. This was Zachary Taylor's daughter. He entered Congress on 8 December 1845, but he resigned in June of 1846 to serve as colonel of the 1st Mississippi Rifles. The 1st Mississippi Rifles, along with a couple of the other state militia units, basically won the Battle of Buena Vista in Mexico. Um, Davis was severely wounded in the fight, but he fully recovered. He returned to Mississippi. In 1847, he was named to fill a Senate seat. He ran for governor in 1850. He lost, and then he was selected by Franklin Pierce as Secretary of War. So it's, he's come quite a long way. He returned to the Senate in 1857. He resigned in 1861 because of secession, and he proceeded to go back to his plantation, hoping to command Confederate troops in the field, preferably as a brigadier or major general. Much to his surprise, in 1861, he was selected provisional president of the Provisional Confederate States of America, and he had his initial inauguration on the courthouse steps, or the uh, Capitol steps, in Montgomery, Alabama. And if you've been to Montgomery, the same building still stands, and you can go stand on the spot because they got this huge brass plate with a star on it where President Davis took the oath of office as the provisional president. He had a real inauguration later in Richmond and uh, vowed to protect and defend the Confederate States of America, which I'm sure you're all aware of. He actually was against secession to start with, but like a lot of Southerners, he was fed up with the North. He was fed up with tariffs. Among other things, he thought the North was sticking it to the South. He was right. And when his state seceded, the state of Mississippi seceded, he felt his higher duty, his higher calling was to his state and then to the country that the state became part of. All right, we're going to go to the end of the war now. 1865, Grant does the breakthrough at Petersburg. Lee tries to evacuate to the east. Doesn't make it, doesn't get any farther than Appomattox. The Confederate government has collapsed. Jefferson Davis and several members of his um, cabinet evacuate to the south, the intent being to get to Georgia, at least, possibly even as far as Mexico, and keep the fight going. Now, what you see here is um, you initially went to Danville, then they went south to Greensboro, North Carolina. On 5 May 1865, this is roughly three weeks after Appomattox, he held the last meeting of the Confederate cabinet in a bank building in Georgia. At that point, the government of the Confederate States was officially dissolved. So the war ended supposedly in April of 1865. The government did not give its last gasp for another three weeks. On 10 May 1865, he was captured at Irwinville, Georgia. At the time, he was with his postmaster general, John Reagan, Governor Lubbock of Texas, a couple of his staff officers, along with Mrs. Davis, Verena Davis, and four of their children. Now, what I put up here, I did this intentionally. There's two versions of Davis's capture. The one that got through the north... And by the way, the 4th, Mass, uh, 4th Michigan Cavalry is the unit that ran the president to ground. The story that became popular in the North, particularly in the press, particularly among Yankee politicians, was Davis was caught trying to escape dressed in one of Verena's dresses. This is false. It did not happen. But this is the popular image that went through the North. He's a coward. He's a rat. He's a traitor. And he tried to escape dressed as a woman. He did not. He did try to escape on his way out of his tent. He grabbed a shawl that belonged to Verena Davis, his wife, because it was a little chilly, even in May. Of course, <laughs> your, your blood's running cold because you've got armed Yankees coming after you. So he put a shawl on. This is a more accurate presentation of what happened when the 4th Michigan understood, suddenly realized who they had in their possession. President Davis was apprehended. 10 May 1865. He went right into prison. Chris Monroe, Virginia, Hampton Roads, north side, uh, Hampton, Virginia, uh, remained an active army post until a couple, three years ago. It's just recently was handed over to the National Park Service. Uh, it's famous for being the last army fort in the United States that had a moat because it's an original pen pentagonal five-sided fort, you know, designed with guns and stuff like that. <laughs> Despite its location in Hampton Roads, Fort Monroe, fort Monroe never left Union hands. In fact, McClellan, early in the war, that was his big staging point for going up the peninsula, uh, getting back into Norfolk. The Norfolk side, the south side of Hampton Roads, did fall to the Confederates rather early. For three years, President Davis was incarcerated, 
held sort of with charges. The federal government eventually did prefer charges against him um, for treason. Go figure. The indictment actually came down in 1865, over a year after he was put in irons in the casemate at Fort Monroe. If you go to Fort Monroe, even when it was an Army post, which was the last time I was there, this will continue, I know, I have no doubt, under the Park Service. It's called the Casemate Museum. You can go stand in the actual casemate where the President of the Confederate States was held for three years as a prisoner, no legal standing. He wasn't even considered an American anymore because he'd rebelled against the government. He was finally released in 1867. He was held for two years due to the efforts of prominent Northerners and Southerners who basically said, bygones be bygones. One of them included uh, the famous New York newspaper editor, the guy who said, go west, young men. Greeley? Horace Greeley. Thank you. Thank you. So it was a mixed group of people, both north and south, who finally convinced the federal government, the government of uh, 1867, was still Andrew Jackson, to let him go. He was released. He had no... He did not have status as a citizen of the United States. He took Verena and the surviving kids, and they went to Europe and Canada and basically traveled for a couple, three years. 1869, the federal government finally dropped all charges. They kept him hanging for four years. When they dropped the charges, he started coming back to the States. And initially, his first job after serving as president of the Confederate States, he managed a bank in Memphis, Tennessee. Now we're going to turn to his final home, this is all kind of taking along in the same place. Beauvoir was built between 1848 and 1851 on a plot of land on the coast closer to Biloxi than, Gulf, than Gulfport. It's right on now U.S. 90, I want to say 98. Uh, planner from Madison County, Mississippi, bought the property in 48. His name was James Brown. He brought in slaves from his plantation, built a sawmill on the property, and built the house himself along with two supporting buildings out front. Using native trees, including cypress, he imported the slate from England. This is all 10 years before the war. The cottages out front, one was to the east, over in this direction. This is the side facing the water, which was known as the library. It was also the school for his children. So he built it, and it's, it's big enough, suitable, a person could use it. It's like a, as it stands now, it's like a big four-bedroom apartment. He built a repeat, uh, second building on the other side, right over here out of photo view which was supposed to be the guest house, the number one guests. The most people that stayed in the guest house all the years it stood were Methodist circuit riders, pastors who were working up and down the coast holding uh, services. It became well known. Beauvoir was the place to stay. Free room and board, I guess. So anyway, so both buildings were highly used. He also added some other properties. 1873, under following his Brown's death, the property was sold under a court order to a gentleman named Frank Johnson. He subsequently sold it to Samuel Dorsey and his wife, Sarah Ann Dorsey, who is the lady on the right. This is the woman who eventually sold the property to the Davises, and it's kind of an interesting story how they got there. She was a classmate of Verena Davis, so she already knew the family. Uh, classmate, you may think in your head, okay, when uh, elementary school, I mean, women didn't go to college back then, right? Post-elementary school, women didn't really get too far through high school back then, right? Well, Ms. Dorsey and Verena Davis were classmates in a very exclusive French school in Paris some years before. So apparently their two families were quite well off. In fact, if there's one comment I've learned about both of Davis's marriages, uh, the first one to Zachary Taylor's daughter, the one that ended tragically with her premature death, and the one with Verena, neither, none of his in-laws really liked him, at least at first glance. They didn't really trust the guy. I mean, he was a army man. He was probably violent. He, was, he walked with a spring in his step like an Indian brave. That would scare any parrot off. So, you know, he just... But anyway, there's other reasons for problems with, the, you know, his marrying Verena. We'll get into that in a bit. But anyway, Ms. Pro Ms. Dorsey was a, write, a, a rarity for the time. She was a very successful female novelist. She wrote stories. She wrote books. She was very, very, very popular. She and her husband were quite well off. In fact, they owned several plantations in Louisiana. This was their main home, but she would regularly go back to Louisiana. In 1875, while on a business trip to Mobile, Davis thought, you know, I'm not getting any younger. It's been 10 years since the war. I want to settle down somewhere and start writing my memoirs. And I would love to do it back in my adopted home state of Mississippi, preferably on the Gulf Coast. So he did a tour of the Gulf Coast, basically from one end to the other, uh, the Mississippi Gulf Coast, his home state looking at properties, and he made a courtesy call on the owner of Belvoir, 
Beauvoir. But the problem was she was out of town at the time. She was over in Louisiana checking on the on the, uh, the plantations. But he liked what he saw, so he left Miss Dorsey a note. Um, said the uh, house was a fine place with a large and beautiful house and many orange trees yet full of fruit and indicated he would be back. He was, two years later. Two years later, 1877, he comes back. By this time, Miss Dorsey is dying of cancer and she knows it. Her husband's already passed on. Other issues um, may have been old age, probably natural causes, and of course common for the time the wife tended to be fair amount younger than the husband. But anyway, he, once again, he's looking for a place to settle down permanently to write about the history of the Confederacy and write his memoirs. Now, at the time, Verena and the two daughters, and I think their, the, their surviving son, Jefferson Davis Jr., were in England still. And when he said, I'm going back to looking for property in the United States, we can settle down in retirement and I can write, she said, whatever you do, don't go to the Gulf Coast. You know I hate it there. Now, does that sound like a typical guy or what? <laughs> Oh, don't worry, honey. I'm not going anywhere near the Gulf Coast. I promise you. I won't look there because I know you don't want to live there. Where did he go? Right to Gulfport, Biloxi. Checked in with Ms. Dorsey. Looked at the property. He wrote afterwards, The house was surrounded by live oaks, magnolias, and cedars with Spanish moss festooning the live oaks. Not just growing on, but festooning. The sea lay in front of the house, and behind the house was an orange grove. Beyond that was a pine forest, crossed by a running brook, on the banks of which grew wild azalea, bay, yellow jasmine, and sweet olive. Ms. Dorsey offered a rental of the East Cottage. This building here, remember this is one that was originally a library and a school. Davis, despite his somewhat difficult financial circumstances, paid to have two additional rooms built on for use as bedrooms. One for him and one for his son, Jeff Davis, Jr., Jeff Davis Jr. was the initial person who actually did the writing. The president dictated, this is very common, dictated his memoirs about the war, specifically the war, and the history of the Confederacy from 61 to 65. Jeff Jr. did the actual writing down and took the notes. As you can see, Jeff Jr. here, about age 20. Strikingly good-looking young man, obviously very attached to his family. Tragically, at age 20, he died of yellow fever. There was a yellow fever epidemic in the Gulf Coast, went some ways up the Mississippi River, killed 20,000 in um, uh, Mississippi, coastal Alabama, Louisiana. I'm not sure, Walter, I don't know if you'd know either, is that the same yellow fever that killed Hood and his family over New Orleans? It must have been about the same time. It was devastating. For the record, if you're wondering about it, this was a truly tragic family in many ways. Um, the other children... The Davises between them had six. This was the last of the four boys. He's the only one who made it to 20. Sam Davis died in 1854 at age two, unknown causes. Joseph Davis is the one who fell from the window at the White House in Richmond, age five, 1864. Reportedly, President Davis never recovered from that one. I can't imagine recovering from any death of a child. And the third son was William Davis, who died of diphtheria in 1872 at age 11. So here they are, getting into retirement. Looks like he's found a place where he can sit and finally write. And they're down to two kids, just the, the, just the daughters, Winnie and I believe Margaret was the name of the other one. After he settled in and following the death of Jeff Jr., Verena and Margaret came back from England. I'm not sure where Winnie was at the time and agreed to live in Gulfport or at Beauvoir with Davis, kind of crammed into this house. But like I said earlier... Ms. Dorsey realized she was dying, so she got her lawyer. Uh, let me back up a little bit. 1877, while Davis, once the word got out that he was on the coast, close to a railroad line, the Louisville and Nashville actually ran through the backside of the property. In fact, they actually built a small station there for people specifically wanted to get off and meet the Davises or meet the president, talk about the war, talk about what happened, talk about politics, whatever. Um, one of the visitors in late 1877 was Jubal Early, former general of Confederate States Army. And Ms. Ms., uh, Ms. Dorsey talked to the general, and he said, how is he doing? And she said, he's really, really broke. They're barely hanging on. They have it rough, but I've taken care of that. What she had done is she got her lawyer and rewrote her will. She wrote her own family out of it. Apparently she was somewhat estranged from them, and she gave the whole house and property to the Davises. Now, when she did die, and it became their property, they'd already made arrangements to buy Beauvoir, and had made one payment. 
he made sure that two more payments, I'm not sure where he got the money, probably people made donations and such. He made sure they paid for the property properly so it was actually Davis's property. You still occasionally hear about the fact the former president, yes, he was kind of he was relying on the help of others, but you occasionally hear stories, yeah, what kind of person was he? You know, he inherited Beauvoir. It wasn't really his home. No. With her death, this became the Davis family property. He paid for it fair and square. $5,500 and three payments. Here's a photo from 1885, the getting up in years from the left. You can see the three grandkids uh, from Margaret, and that's, uh, that's Margaret Davis Hayes on the left of the photo. The president in the middle, the house servant in the, to the rear, and Mrs. Davis, Verena Davis, on the right. Over 1886 and 1887, when he wasn't in this building, this is, the, uh, this is the main house now. They moved up to the main house, but he would still go out to the East Cottage, the library, to do his writing. And he had a series of people that would help him and take the dictation. 1886, 1887, he spent a lot of time, though, traveling through the South, attending reunions, attending public presentations, attending Fourth of, uh, celebrations, Fourth of July or otherwise. Story in Vicksburg for years is they never did celebrate the Fourth of July. I don't know if he went up there. When he was May 1887 in New Orleans, he told the group, United you are now, and if the Union is ever to be broken, let the other side break it first. You know, he considered himself an American. Now it gets really interesting, and this is almost a replica of U.S. Grant, or almost a repeat. October 1889, October, he completed his short history of the Confederate States of America. This was the president's own view of what happened, why the, where the South succeeded, where it failed. Less than a month later, he left Beauvoir to take a train ride to New Orleans. In New Orleans, he got on a steamship and started up on the Mississippi River to visit Briarfield. Maybe he thought his time might be drawing short. Maybe he was just nostalgic for his old home. His plantation fairly well survived the war, but after the war, he sold it to one of his former slaves, if you can believe that, who turned it into quite a successful operation. It had been successful before the war. When he got to Briarfield, by the time the boat pulled in, he was too ill to leave the boat. He'd left with a bad cold. It got worse, very much worse. By the time he got, excuse me, to Briarfield, he had a very, very bad cold. They got word to Verena. She immediately headed to New Orleans. This was the standard way, ride the train to New Orleans, get on the boat. She started going north on the Mississippi. The president went up to Vicksburg, stayed on the house for about four days, couldn't get out of bed. They carried him back to the ship. The idea was to get him back to New Orleans, where all the really good doctors were. New Orleans was still the major city of this part of the South. Ironically, the two steamships were owned by a father and son team, so needless to say, they communicated with each other when they passed. And when they were passing, they found out the ailing president's on the southbound ship, and his wife, who's very concerned, is on the northbound ship. They, they hove to, tied up. She went across over to the southbound vessel, and when the, Davis came, uh, when the president came out of a four-day coma, in effect, he was shocked to find his wife there holding his hand, telling him it was going to be all right. Ship docked in Baton Rouge. Two doctors diagnosed acute bronchitis and malaria. When he got to New Orleans, several prominent citizens greeted him. He was taken to the home of a Supreme Court justice, Charles Fenner. He lost consciousness the evening of the 5th. And at 12.45 in the morning on the 6th, with Verena by his side, President Davis died. The funeral was the largest ever seen in the South to that date. Love him or hate him, and a lot of people didn't like him as the president. Love him or hate him. This was a symbol of the lost cause, which was still a few years off as far as becoming a popular theme of the war. Multiple trains came from out the South, and some from the North, carrying mortars. A lot of his old enemies... This is kind of a repeat of Grant's funeral. A lot of his old enemies, generals that had fought against his generals, made a point of making the trip all the way down to New Orleans to participate in this huge, huge parade, funeral parade. William Sampson was one of his former slaves, was interviewed by a northern reporter. You can always trust the press, right? Nod your heads. Yes, let me know you're out there. Okay, yeah, you can always trust the press, right? Okay. Porter thought he had a story. Because all these accolades about the late president. What was it like working for him, and why are you here? William Sampson, former slave, property of Jefferson Davis, said, I loved him, and I can say that every color man, colored man he ever owned loved him. 
Initially, he was entombed in the Army of Northern Virginia tomb at Metairie State, uh, Cemetery in New Orleans. In 1893, Mrs. Davis decided he should be home at the Capitol, where he presided over the Confederate States for almost four years. So they unearthed the, they unearthed the coffin, had another big ceremony, Louisville and Nashville, free of charge, major railroad in the South, transported the body all the way up to Richmond through the South. Again, kind of this, in this case, this is kind of a reverse direction repeat of the Lincoln train. Every stop, they had to stop because of the crowds, people on the tracks, people waving flags, people crying. With his death, and this had been written into his will, ownership of Beauvoir passed to Winnie because she was the youngest surviving member of the family, and they figured she'd be around the longest. Winnie, unfortunately, however, died in 1898 in Rhode Island. Um, she had never married. And there's this kind of a, there's an interesting side story there. For whatever reason, she had been making regular trips up to New England. She went to a party one night. A bunch of people found out she was Jeff Davis's daughter and started giving her a lot of grief. I mean, in your face, finger pointing. You know, they could have run for governor of Arizona. You know, but anyway, um, a young man, a Yankee war veteran, rushed to her defense probably because she was drop-dead beautiful, maybe because he was just a good, gallant individual. And they were, it was like love at first sight. They met the people they wanted to marry. There was one slight issue. He's a northerner. He's not only a northerner, he fought against us in the last war. And when, I hate to say this, but when the word got out that the daughter of the president, the late president of the Confederacy, well, he was still alive at the time. In fact, he actually didn't have a problem with it. It was Verena had the bigger problem. When the word got out, particularly among the veterans, that the daughter of the president was going to marry a Yankee, there was an uproar. And it was such a big uproar, the, two cu the couple sadly realized they could never be married. Neither of them ever married. She died at 28, single. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. It's easy enough to find out. I believe he lived into his 60s. He never married. He'd lost the one true love of his wife in life. Anyway, with Winnie's death... Ownership passed to Verena, and while she was cleaning out some of uh, her, husband, her late husband's papers, she found he had started a second book, his memoirs, his biogra autobiography. She finished it. Turned out she was a pretty good writer, too, just like Mrs. Dor the late Mrs. Dorsey, one of the original owners of the property. She did such a bang-up job with the book, which sold just as popularly as this, his history of the Confederacy, that the New York World newspaper offered her a position of a full-time writer. Well, she had no real means of support. Still had one daughter, Margaret, with grandkids, so she took the job, moved to New York City. She, uh, as part of the deal, she decided she had to sell Beauvoir. This is about 1890, 1898. Uh, kind of a forecast of modern times. The chief organizations interested in buying the property were like hotel companies and stuff that wanted to develop the beach for tourism. And, 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 and lodging, you know, make a big grand hotel, which meant, of course, they were going to tear down, bulldo well, bulldoze, clear out the property, clear out this historic house. She refused. She turned down a $90,000 offer. I can't Im and that's in 1898 money. I, don't, I can't imagine what that would be worth now, probably in the millions. But no, she would not. She finally sold it to the Mississippi di Division of the uh, United Confederate Veterans, or the Sons of Confederate Veterans, I'm sorry, for $10,000 with the understanding, this was written into the transfer, the title transfer, permanent use as a home for Confederate veterans, their wives, and their widows, and as a memorial and shrine to President Davis and the Confederacy. They agreed hold Harley. She moved to New York, died eight years later at age 80 in New York City on 16 October 1906. There was another huge funeral. This procession went from New York south to Richmond. Same thing all over again, trains, stops, and she was rendered full honors as befits the First Lady of the Confederacy at Hollywood ceremony when they laid her to rest next to her husband. And the honor guard consisted 100% of Confederate veterans. Some of them actually still fit in their uniform. Now a little bit real quick about these pictures because I stumbled across these. They, I mentioned, you know, difference in ages. This, th this kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. They were married on 28 February 1845. She was 19. He was... <gasps> 37, over the hill. Here's the happy couple. This is the wedding photo, the day they got married in 1845. Okay? This, is the for this is her official portrait from when she was a lovely young lady. This picture was taken towards the end. She retained her beauty throughout her life. 
Very strong woman, very capable. Very much loved her husband. It's one of the reasons we still have Beauvoir. After her passing, after the sale and eventually her passing, it did become a Confederate home and cemetery. Hundreds of veterans checked in within the first couple of years. In order to support the use as a Confederate home, they erected several buildings, including barracks for the single veterans, apartments for the married veterans or the widows, um, a hospital, dining room, and chapel. They also had a cemetery for obvious reasons, which eventually contained uh, the remains of 800 veterans, as well as the tomb of the unknown Confederate. And I've got a copy of that photo on my computer. I forgot to, I wasn't able to get it back in the present presentation. Family friend named Mrs. Kimbrough took the lead in making sure that besides serving as a Confederate home, it remained a memorial to President Davis, his family, and the Confederacy. She was, uh, she was the one who came up with the term for Beauvoir of Mount Vernon of the Confederacy, and she led the fundraising efforts, which included articles, speeches, newspaper appeals. She actually is the person who raised the $10,000 so that the SCV could buy the property and hold on to it. So she's owed a lot of credit. The home remained in use until 1957. 54 years. The last three residents were three widows. And they were so far gone by that time, sadly, they couldn't, uh, the home could not care for them, plus large facility, only three people in it. And they were transferred, actually, to a, no kidding, rest home or a nursing home in Greenville, up in the northern part of the state. Uh, by 1956, it had become a state historic site. Eventually, Beauvoir ended up on the National Historic Landmark. I'm sorry, I just realized you guys can't see anything I'm talking about here. And it's still owned by the Mississippi Division of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. So it is a National Historic Landmark. It is a state historic site. It is owned by the SCV. Ah, but that becomes an issue. 1969. Anybody remember Camille, what it did to the Gulf Coast? Okay. Interesting point about this. If we walk through Beauvoir, after they did the restoration after Katrina, they left one corner from the Camille damage up there, exposed. So you can see that this is the kind of thing that happens in the Gulf Post periodically. It was kind of unique. And I, you know, I, tell the, I tell the story, I don't know where you all were in August of 05 when Katrina happened, hit. And of course, New Orleans got 99.9% .9 of the attention for some strange reason. July of 05, I was in Panama City, Florida with the Air Force. I actually had to do a hurricane evacuation. It's the first one I'd done since I was flying with the Navy at Oceana, Virginia. And we went inland up to uh, Warner Robins, Georgia, hung out there for about a week. And I remember, getting, I remember getting, it was Hurricane Dennis, which ended up kind of meandering around and never really did anything to anybody. I think it went across South Florida. By then, it pretty well spent. But I remember getting back to Panama City and everybody going, this is July of 05. Well, so much for hurricane season. That was it. That was the one big blow. Yeah, right. Okay. And a month later, I left active duty, went back to Washington, packed up my gear, moved down here. I've been an Air Force civilian ever since. August 2005, Katrina. Beauvoir and its grounds were seriously damaged by Camille in 69. <coughs> Katrina wiped the place out, as, long, as well as most of the Gulf Coast. Again, the emphasis, all the media coverage, was on New Orleans. And i got to admit, with everything that was going on in New Orleans, I could understand why the media concentrated on it, plus all the political BS that was going on. Um, my observation the first time I got back down here after Katrina was 100 yards from the water line, everything is gone. Trees, buildings, houses. People were living on concrete slabs and trailers, trying to do what they could to preserve their property. You can see the photos, and I can, I can put them up later if you want an up close. This damage, this desolation is typical. This used to be a huge apartment complex. First Baptist Church of Gulfport had to be replaced. It was just completely destroyed. As far as the property itself, amazingly enough, what survived the best was the old house, the 1848 to 1851 Beauvoir, the main house itself. Why? Again, built to a different design, different standard, built to last. It was on brick pillars, eight feet tall, so most of the storage surge, what storm surge went underneath. The wind is what did most of the damage, opened up the roof, and you'll see in a second, in fact, I can go ahead and turn it now. Opened up the roof, took the, took the porch, Pretty much clean off. These are various angles. This is from, this is the front of the house. You're looking at it from the East Cottage, where the East Cottage used to stand. East Cottage, West Cottage, the library and the old circuit writer house, gone. They were frame buildings on the ground. What few buildings remain from the Confederate home, gone. Most of the trees, a lot of the trees, 
gone. Museum and library, which were, and right here, you're looking directly at the front of the house where the steps and everything were. Museum and library were back over here, some yards back. Survived, but it was so badly damaged, they ended up deciding, they decided eventually just tear it down and build a brand new one. I've got a picture on the last slide of the new one going up. This is the interior. Look at this, wind and water damage. The museum, swords, weapons from the 1860s, exposed to water, salt spray. What do you think happened? They're still, exactly. They're still working on them, but they're doing it. They managed to save the flags. I think the flags were actually removed and sent to Jackson before the storm hit, once they got in a good idea what was coming. Most of those are still being uh, refurbished now, but it, they needed it anyway. Um, interesting side impact from all this. When the decision was made to restore Beauvoir, they held a ceremony. Uh, started work actually started on May two, uh, 3rd, May 2007. Speakers included Bert Hayes Davis, who's one of the surviving members of the Davis family. At that time, this is 2007, five years ago, there was a big fight between Mississippi Division SCV and SCV National over who actually owned the property. If you can't read this, sense of humor, this is one of my two favorite signs from Katrina. I mean, obviously tragic. There's not a lot of funny stuff that happened there. But this one says, halftime score, Katrina won, Beauvoir zero, but the game is not over. <laughs> totally different issue. This was a, there's another photo that was out there from the time. has nothing to do with Beauvoir, but I'm going to tell you anyway because I'm the speaker. Um, all the problems they had in New Orleans. And you remember the police were seizing guns from law-abiding citizens. I saw a photo some guys took in one of the neighborhoods, I believe on the lake north side of Pontchartrain, Bunch of guys, about 30 of them, armed to the teeth, pistols, large rep rifles, cans of beer, and a big sign that said, Your biggest nightmare, drunks with guns. <laughs> Reportedly, that neighborhood had no problems following Hurricane Katrina. Just another historical note, glad to give it to you, no need to thank me. <laughs> Beauvoir reopened June of 2008, on the 3rd of June 2008. This two pictures here. This is the restored interior. This is the parlor. When you walk in the house, this is the first room on the left. Big, broad veranda or porch, and there's, a, there's a, a, a hall that goes right down the middle with the rooms on the sides. So you walk in, and on the left, you've got the, you've got the, the, the parlor where he would greet visitors if he didn't greet them on the porch. On the right, his main bedroom, two other bedrooms, one for Verena back left, one for Margaret, their surviving daughter, back right. Behind was the cookhouse or the kitchen plus the other buildings which they re they did rebuild the two side buildings and they're rebuilding other structures as they can December 09 they had groundbreaking for the brand new Jefferson Davis Presidential Library and Museum Beauvoir as it stands today is still something of a mess but the house is completely restored and is open I think the tour costs 10 bucks it's well worth it someone will walk you through and tell you all about what happened what went on here point out all the aspects of the house. Uh, I mentioned earlier, there's a gift shop temporarily in a trailer. When they get the museum done and they're aiming for this summer, then they'll put the gift shop back in the museum. I believe they charged, I seem to recall, one of my first road trips down there back around 07 or 08, the museum was open. They were still trying to save the building. I mean, portions of it were closed off. A lot of the displays had been removed, obviously. And there was an admission fee. I don't remember what it was. My attitude is it's well worth it. And by the way, when you see the jar at the door, throw another 10 bucks in it. They need the money. But they're doing a magnificent job down there. I'm very, very, very impressed with what they've accomplished down there. Beauvoir holds regular events during the year. Uh, Confederate Memorial Day ceremony. The uh, 30 April 2011 event. Uh, featured the unveiling of the restored United Daughters of Confederacy Memorial Arch. If you remember back a couple, three slides, this huge arch that was built by the UDC as an entryway to the cemetery. That's been, they had to build a new one. That one came down, but they saved the wrought iron gates. Uh, some of the veterans, the cemetery itself is currently still off limits. They're cleaning it up, but the, the bodies were not disturbed, thankfully. Just out of curiosity, one of the web pages I used for research has the list of all 800 veterans and widows who are buried there. And they include C.A. Red, 41st Alabama Infantry, who died on 19 January 1921. Other names included B.T. Beasley, 30th Mississippi, 5 September 31. Uh, and let's see, oh yeah, S.A. Merritt, 
Third Mississippi, 7 September 24th. I can't imagine what it was like, these guys living into the 1920s and 1930s. No, no kick lighters. No kick lighters, I checked. No Altmans. Uh, they also hold a fall muster, usually about 3,500 participants and spectators. When I showed the Battle of Biloxi slide with the Confederate reenactors, that was an actual reenactment fall muster on the property of Beauvoir. 2010 event, they actually had a, a U.S. Senator, no kidding, U.S. Senator, Roger Wicker, got to fire the cannon. Apparently, shortly afterwards, the uh, Beauvoir got extra money from Congress. You'll, you'll notice if you go down there, um, they are rebuilding. Houses are going back up. The, I get the feeling Harrison County or the cities of Gulfport and Biloxi are being very careful about commercial development. They're not going to let people just rush in and rebuild immediately. Um, you know, the analogy I would use is the 93 flood across, across the river where, uh, you know, where did they do all the massive construction strip malls in a floodplain in Chesterfield? They're not doing it down there. They're being very, very, very careful. It's rare to see a brand new house that isn't up on stilts now, although the Katrina's winds did as much damage as the water. Uh, if anybody's been to Keesler, you may have seen the photos. This is the big Air Force base down in Biloxi. Keesler was underwater. When you walk in, when you drive in, you walk in, you walk onto the property. This is the first view you have. Here's the reconstructed library or East Building. Here's the house, statue of President Davis from his porch looking towards the ocean. And in the middle, it was kind of a gray day, but it's really nice. You can sit there, and they got rocking chairs. You can sit and rock and watch the ocean and listen to the breeze and everything else like that and let off with a rebel yell every now and then. They don't mind that. They expect it. You betcha. You betcha. Well, that's one of the reasons, like, a lot of the houses down there had these huge porches because you get out of the sun and get a breeze going, and it's actually not that bad, even in midsummer. This is a photo from the commemoration ceremony in 09 after they, or 08 after they reopened the house. It is, you do get down there. Go here. It is a shrine. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. They've gone through a lot of trouble and hard work to get this place back up and operating. Once they get the museum open again, they're aiming for this summer. It is well worth it. Whatever state you draw your lineage from, wherever your ancestors fought, if you go to Gulfport, Biloxi, you must visit Belvoir, spend the money, take the tour, make a donation, buy souvenirs. There's two still here if anybody's interested. But please, by all means, take advantage of this. This is a really, really phenomenal place. And like Montgomery, Alabama, Mississippi, nobody, I have never heard one peep, one complaint, one argument, one protest on the Gulf Coast about the restoration of Belvoir. Partly because it brings in tourist dollars, obviously. Oh, by the way, which reminds me of another thing, post-Katrina. Does anybody know what the first thing they rebuilt on the Gulf Coast was after Katrina? The casinos. The casinos. Why? It put people to work, and it brings in the bucks. The big issue down there was Mississippi, and I was living in Vicksburg when gambling passed. This was back in 91. Initially in Mississippi, side issue here. Initially in Mississippi, they did a test case. One casino... His, what classic Southern riverboat gambling. So by state law, the casinos in, Vic, in Mississippi have to be on water. They built one casino in Natchez, Mississippi. Anybody here ever been to Natchez? All right, really historic town, really violent, dangerous town, i.e. would have been great liberty call for us, Chief. Um, the problem with Natchez is it's not on any major freeways. It's on two-lane highways. There's an east-west and the north-south highway, which I'm pretty sure is 61. They saw the casinos might bring in some good money and tourists to Mississippi, but it was not going to work in Natchez, so they expanded it to two locations initially, Vicksburg and the Gulf Coast. They have to be on the water. After Katrina, you may have seen the pictures, one of the casinos in, in, in Biloxi was a pirate ship, supposedly. Huge thing. It wound up 150 yards ashore. On the, other side of the, highway. the other side of the highway. Dismasted. Gutted. So when they gave them authorization after they did the initial cleanup and said, you can go in and rebuild the casinos, please do so quickly, they changed the state law specifically for Gulfport, Biloxi only. Those casinos are now on dry land because <laughs> they don't want to go through that again. You go to Vicksburg. I'm not sure about Tunica, south of Memphis. That was the third area or fourth area where they allowed gambling. Vicksburg, they're still on the water. Okay. That pretty much concludes my tour, a little summary of Jefferson Davis's life. Here is the museum that's under construction. It's twice as big as the original. The original was back over here. 
It's now gone. They've leveled it. They finally leveled it. Again, they're aiming for this summer to open it up. I've enjoyed giving this presentation to you. Are there any final questions? Okay, thank you for your time.